Hey, it's Lou, and some wild shit is going down in Hungary. Critics claim the country's prime minister, Viktor Orban, has eroded checks and balances, undercut the free press, inflamed racism and xenophobia, and handed out lucrative government contracts to family and friends. Those are among the many reasons the European Union recently invoked Article 7 against the country. That's a very rare move, only triggered when a nation represents a clear risk to the EU's fundamental values. Orban, meanwhile, is also a leading anti-immigration crusader. He built a border fence that would make Donald Trump green with envy. But he's no dictator. Orban's been elected four times. So the question is, has he hoodwinked voters or is Western-style democracy falling out of favor in Central Europe? In the early 1990s, after nearly a half century of communist rule, Hungarians had to build their own government. They embraced the ideals of Western liberal democracy. Things like free and fair elections, civil rights, open markets, and free trade. Hungary eventually joined the European Union and NATO. Andros Birnaj, co-director of a Hungarian think tank called Policy Solutions, told me this raised expectations in the country. Hungarians thought they'd be better off in the new system. They anticipated new levels of wealth and prosperity. Unfortunately, it did not work out that way. Balaz Jerebic, an expert in Eastern and Central Europe at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, told me Hungary's left-leaning government in the 2000s was corrupt and inept. Their austerity policies diminished quality of life. Plus, at the behest of the EU, they had opened up Hungary's economy to foreign investors. That made the country extremely vulnerable during the 2008 global financial crisis, when foreigners started to pull their money out, unemployment skyrocketed, and the country needed a massive bailout. So, Hungarians started to resent Western-style democracy and the Hungarian elites who were its biggest cheerleaders. The new system simply didn't live up to expectations. Paul Hannebrick, a historian at Rutgers University, told me Hungarians also felt that this new system had been forced on them by outsiders. In addition, the EU was imposing all these new cultural norms and values, like an openness to immigration and multiculturalism, that aren't really organic to Hungarian culture, which is a very homogenous society. So Hungarians became concerned that they were losing their national sovereignty, that their country was being reshaped by EU leaders in Brussels who were pushing a globalist agenda. These conditions, these agreements, set the stage for a strong man to dominate politics, a populist who would stand up to outsiders and put Hungary first. That was, and still is, Viktor Orban. Now, Orban's career trajectory sort of mirrors Hungary's post-Soviet journey. He was a young radical, an Oxford-educated liberal who co-founded a political party with the decidedly punk slogan, don't trust anyone over 35. But Orban slowly drifted to the right side of the political spectrum. As a guy from rural Hungary, he never really fit in with the left-leaning urban elites. Yet, when he became prime minister in 1998, he was relatively moderate, and Bill Clinton praised his vigorous and progressive leadership. But things took a drastic turn after Orban was voted out in 2002. After another loss in the next election, he saw an opportunity on Hungary's far right. The financial crisis and the corrupt shit show that was Hungarian politics created an opening. He was re-elected in 2010 as an anti-establishment figure who promised to undo all these policies supposedly foisted on Hungary by out-of-touch elites and international organizations like the EU and the International Monetary Fund. I'll note that at the time, Orban was well over 35 years old. Anyway, as he was set to reclaim the prime minister's office, someone asked him if he was afraid of all the issues facing the country. He reportedly replied, I like chaos because I can build a new order from this chaos, an order I want. The problem is this order shares a bunch of characteristics with authoritarianism. Orban has stacked the constitutional court, government oversight positions, and public media with people who are loyal to him and who will cooperate with his agenda. Meanwhile, many of the country's leading independent media publications have been purchased by oligarchs friendly to his regime. The nation of Hungary appears on a dangerous path, but observers warn Hungary's democracy seems increasingly fragile. Orban has also begun to reshape the country's cultural life in his own image, funding the work of artists and theater companies who parrot his nativist anti-Western rhetoric. On the other hand, academics and intellectuals who express dissent are often on the wrong side of budget cuts or are subject to politically motivated scrutiny. All this has allowed Orban to intimidate and crowd out voices of opposition. That's a major advantage when it comes to campaigning, as is the fact that he's gerrymandered the country, giving a big advantage to the party in power. 
Orban's coalition won 48% of the vote in the April 2018 election, but enjoys a two-thirds supermajority in parliament. Part of the problem is that his political rivals can't get their act together. The opposition in Hungary is deeply divided. Orban's cronies have benefited from this dominance and this lack of accountability. Several of his friends, including one of his closest childhood friends, have been the beneficiary of billions of dollars in government contracts. His son-in-law has also gotten rich from suspiciously allotted public money. Remember, this is all going on right underneath the EU's nose. So how the hell does Orban keep getting away with it? And why does he still have so much support from within the country? Well, as the saying goes, it's the economy, stupid. Hungarian GDP growth exceeds the European average. The Hungarian rich, in particular, have thrived during his tenure thanks to tax reform. So Orban essentially keeps the wealthy and upper middle class happy by giving them money. On the other hand, Bironaj told me Orban keeps everyone else compliant, particularly voters in rural areas, by feeding them fear and hatred. Orban's number one issue has been the harm immigrants can inflict upon the country. This message is omnipresent on billboards, on TVs, even in the school curriculum. An eighth grade history textbook asserts it could be problematic for different cultures to coexist. But in Orban's telling, that dangerous multiculturalism is exactly what the EU wants. These globalist elites in Brussels want to flood Hungary with all these menacing migrants, mostly from Africa and the Middle East, mostly Muslims. So Orban, who rewrote the Hungarian constitution to, quote, recognize the role of Christianity in preserving nationhood, frames himself as this fearless leader who won't allow Muslim invaders to poison his country. Hence, he's pushed back on the EU's refugee quotas. He's erected a border fence. He's even passed a law making it illegal to help migrants. This has had the effect of scaring off humanitarian groups. It's also part of the reason that so many people on the far right love Orban. Steve Bannon called him a hero. But anyway, immigrants aren't the only boogeymen that Orban attacks for political ends. He claims that foreign interests are trying to meddle in the country, particularly Hungarian-American billionaire George Soros, which is sort of ironic because Soros funded Orban's Oxford education. Orban also loves bashing the EU. Here's yet another foreign entity supposedly attacking Hungary, and actually, Here's more irony as well, because the European Union gives Hungary a ton of development money. In fact, Hungary is one of the largest recipients of EU dollars. That's integral to Hungary's economic growth and, frankly, the patronage system that Orban runs. He's like a teenager that bitches and moans about his parents, but never forgets to collect his allowance. Orban calls this apparent contradiction the dance of the peacock. He claims he makes certain symbolic gestures to make the EU happy, but he's really executing his own agenda full steam ahead. Our Daniel Kellerman, a political scientist also at Rutgers University, told me the EU has allowed Orban to act like an autocrat, but has simultaneously curbed a lot of his worst instincts. On the one hand, they provide him funds and legitimize his stature. The biggest political party in the European Parliament needs Orban's support to maintain its majority, so they've given him a long leash. But on the other hand, Orban knows the EU wouldn't tolerate the type of violent oppression characteristic of someone like Vladimir Putin, who in fact, Orban admires and has been cozying up to. So in this way, Orban is sort of a managed autocrat light. That triggering of Article 7, which could eventually lead to substantial penalties, was the European Parliament's way of reeling him back in a little bit, reminding him not to take things too far. Jarabic, meanwhile, told me Orban's mostly about rhetoric. I mean, the guy is a bit of a blowhard that definitely harasses and intimidates critics, but his policies outside of fear-mongering aren't very clear. His politics are more about the things he opposes than the things he stands for. That means he always has to find a new bad guy, a new person or organization or trend that's threatening Hungary. First, it was Western democracy, then it was the media, then it was immigrants, then it was George Soros, then it was the EU, and who knows where else that goes. But perhaps it's only a matter of time before that act gets tired, before Hungarians realize the prime minister crying wolf is himself the wolf. And in fact, almost half of all young Hungarians want to leave the country. That is not sustainable. That's the real threat to the country, an existential threat. And for that, Orban's not the solution, he's the problem.